let's get started for today today's lecture so now we are going to change gears we have been talking about how to design feedback control strategies so far and uh, and now that we understand there are different ways of uh, coming up with control strategies in uh, in in control systems in feedback control system let's talk about probability and statistics this okay so probability and statistics is one of the um, one of the most important tools for cyber attack detection and the reason is most of the systems that we will encounter on a day-to-day -day basis uh, they undergo a lot of uh, there are a lot of risks involved in those processes. And the way you measure risk is through probability. And the way you understand risk and mitigate risk is through statistics and feedback control design techniques. So we haven't talked about how to design feedback controllers when there is risks involved within the processes. But that's what we are going to study in the next two weeks. So the different topics that we will touch upon in the coming this week and the next week is probability, uh, statistics, hypothesis testing, Markov chains, and Markov decision processes. So a lot of stuff that we are going to talk about in the next two weeks. Um, and there are courses on each of the topics alone. So there is a course on probability theory. There is a course on statistics. There is a course on Markov chains and Markov decision processes. So we'll just sample some of the stuff, some of the foundational stuff from each of these courses. And I'll talk about it in the class. And then uh, we will integrate all of the stuff together in the subsequent weeks when we talk about attack detection and attack mitigation. Okay, so when I talk about probability, there are two things that we need to understand. The first is risk and the second is uncertainty. So consider this situation. Uh, we have, uh, so tomorrow, there's going to be some weather in Columbus, right? And that weather will involve some uh, uh, humidity change over a period of a day, and some temperature change over a period of a day. And we need to optimize the air conditioning system of this particular building, this building or the entire campus, okay? Now, do you think we have processes in place within the building to manage the temperature inside the building for tomorrow? What do you think? Do you think that the building will be able to manage the temperature set points tomorrow? Right? So I think we can manage the temperature set points tomorrow. We have all the processes in place to make sure that the building's temperature is within certain bounds. Now consider another situation where a tornado is going to come and hit the campus tomorrow. Do you think that we have processes in place to make sure everything is working as intended? We don't quite know what's going to fail. Okay, so it's unknown at this point of time. Uh, hopefully the university is prepared for a tornado at some point of time, but maybe when the tornado comes and hits the university, we'll find out what all things can break when a tornado hits this, this particular university, right? So we are considering two separate situations. Both of them are, uh, there is some amount of unknown in these two processes. We don't quite know what the temperature outside is going to be or what the humidity outside is going to be. Uh, we don't know how many people are going to come inside the classroom and how many people are not going to come to the classroom tomorrow. So there is a lot of uncertainty or un, un, I shouldn't say uncertainty because uncertainty here is a specific term. So there is quite a bit of unknowns for tomorrow, but the fact is those unknowns are measurable. We can measure, we can understand some statistical properties of those unknowns. And those are known as risks. So these are unknowns which can be measured where the statistical properties of the underlying processes can be measured. Those are known as risk. Uncertainty are on the other hand, unknowns 
that either we do not know or we know that something like that can happen, but we don't quite know whether everything is going to work as intended or not. So that's uncertainty. So extreme weather events, forest fires, okay, um, uh, uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, these are uncertainties. We don't quite know how the systems are going to, uh, unless the system is designed for that particular situation, we don't quite know how the system is going to respond to those events. Uh, they are also unknowns. We don't know when the tornado will hit the university. We don't know when a hurricane would hit the university, right? But, uh, but, but there are still the risks that we understand. I mean, there are still uh, things that could potentially uh, hit the university at some point of time. And that's known as uncertainty. There are also unknown unknown where you don't even know that that can happen to the university. Um, I'm trying to think of an example of unknown unknown. So unknown unknown is something that you don't even know whether it will happen or not. Like, you can't even conceive that something like that could happen. But it would happen at some point of time. And that's when we know that, oh, actually this can happen. So maybe 20 years ago, may not maybe 20 years ago, 100 years ago, people wouldn't have thought that there will be so many extreme weather events between 2000 to 2020. OK, there are the, the, the most devastating hurricanes. I mean, not the most, but devastating hurricanes, forest fires, and all that stuff. A lot of them had happened between 2000 to 2020. And of course, climate scientists had warned us that some things like these will happen in 1970s. But in 1920s, nobody knew that such things could happen in the country. And so they developed the city thinking that everything is going to be fine for the next 100 years. But the fact of the matter is things are not fine today. OK, so those were unknown unknown in 1920s. Sitting in 2020, I, don't, I can't really predict what is going to be unknown unknown in, in 2120, OK? So that's also part of uncertainty. So th those are unknown unknowns. And then there are known unknowns. So known unknowns are, we know a tornado is going to hit the university at some point of time in the future. It could be in the next five years. It could be in the next 100 years. It could be in the next 500 years. We don't know when is that going to happen. So that's the unknown part. But we know that at some point of time, that can happen in the city of Columbus. So, so that's also part of uncertainty. So risks are, uh, I don't want to use uncertainty, so unknowns whose prob probability distribution is known. So this is like weather. Let me write it here. Example, weather. Humidity, people in classroom, how many people are going to come to my class? Okay, so these are risks, these are unknowns where the probability distribution is kind of known. Some of you come to class every day, some of you come to class once in a while, but the probability distribution can be estimated over long periods of time. It's not really a uh, it's an unknown, but, but we can measure. In some sense, we can measure that unknown. Uncertainty unknowns whose distributions or probabilities cannot be Uh, estimated. It can be either due to lack of data or just lack of foresight. Can someone tell me, so we talked about tornadoes on the universe, like tornadoes hitting the university, uh, but can someone else come up with an example of unknowns? Well, pandemic is another unknown. We knew pandemic will happen at some point of time because there has been pandemics in the past in the history of uh, the planet. 
but it wasn't clear in 2019 that that will happen in 2020 and 2021, right? So that's an unknown where the probability cannot be estimated because it doesn't happen on a regular basis. Okay, so that's an uncertainty. What else? Uh, can you think of an example from your day-to-day -day life where you think that something cannot happen and then it happened and that's when you realize that, oh, this can actually happen, right? Can you come up with some example? In autonomous uh, driving, right. the human uh, factor is kind of uncertain. Correct. Very good, very good. So autonomous, so if you have autonomous uh, uh, cars on the road, it has not happened in the past, so if you have autonomous cars on the road, we don't quite know how the humans and autonomous cars are going to interact. We can do some research about it, like we can have a small test setting where we can figure things out, but it's still largely unknown because the world is very large, and the number of situations that could arise in this world is extremely large. Um, so we don't know how, the, how that is going to play out. What happens when there is a, so I went to Yellowstone uh, many years ago, and when I'm driving on the road, sometimes a bison is going to cross the road, sometimes there are going to be other animals on the road because it's a national park. And I, I don't know what would happen if you put an autonomous car there. Is the autonomous car going to recognize that there is a bison on the road or how are we supposed to interact with wildlife and things like that? So it's not clear, right? And that's an unknown. Any other unknowns that you can think of? Have you guys heard of the recent cyber attack on a gas plant in New York? There was a, uh, there was a gas, uh, uh, what is that called, company, a gas pipeline, and there was a cyber attack on the gas pipeline, I think somewhere in March or, or April, and it created a lot of havoc in this area, in the Ohio and New York region. Um, so it wasn't clear whether that particular gas pipeline will get attacked by hackers or not, right? So that's an unknown. Now that they know, all the gas companies are scrambling to get their security systems up to date so that they should not be hacked in the future, or at least uh, the hackers will have to spend a lot of effort in hacking each of those subsystems. Okay, so that's an unknown. It was unknown until then that the gas systems could be hacked. Now that this became known, people are working towards fixing those security vulnerabilities. So that's also an unknown. In uh, February, uh, if you rec I mean, I don't know whether you, you, you've read the news or not, but in February, there was a uh, polar vortex, because of which in Texas, uh, the temperature went below like, like in negatives, okay, minus 10 or minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And Texas is typically a hot state. Uh, the temperatures are seldom below 32 in Texas. And when things go below 32, things like everything stops. And so what happened in Texas was because the temperature, temperature went below zero degrees Fahrenheit because of the polar vortex, which is an extreme weather event, the gas pipeline stops functioning, the uh, generators, gas generators stopped functioning, the renewable generators stopped functioning. So pretty much the entire power system collapsed for two, three days in, in, in Texas. And so most of the people were left without power when the outside temperature was minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can imagine what would have happened. There is no gas, they cannot uh, heat their house. So their pipes, the, the water pipes burst inside their house and there was extensive damage throughout the state. Uh, and Houston was particularly affected uh, in, in this particular time. So that was also an unknown. So people who, who bought houses in Texas didn't know that they have to prepare for a situation where the power will be out for two days and the temperature outside would be minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so that's an unknown. That's an uncertainty. And the reason why I'm emphasizing it is when you go to a, work for a company and let's say you are a cybersecurity engineer, the first thing that your supervisor will tell you, look, here are the attacks that we should be secure against, okay? And so those attacks are risks. They are unknowns, you don't know when is that attack going to happen, but at least somebody sat down for several days and thought, 
okay, what's the probability that we'll be attacked here, we'll be attacked here, we'll be attacked here? And they figured out those probabilities in their head through some means, and that's an unknown. That becomes a risk, okay? So that's a risk because they know that, okay, this attack can happen on my system, so therefore I should make my system secure against those attacks. The problem is nobody will know about uncertainty, which is maybe we have fixed these five vulnerabilities in the system, but there is a sixth one which can actually be easily exploited and therefore our system could be hacked. And as a cybersecurity engineer, you will have to deal with risks and uncertainties. It's just part of the game. And what typically happens in the market is an uncertainty strikes and everybody says, oh, you guys are stupid, you don't know what you're doing. But the fact of the matter is that's an uncertainty. You, you could not have estimated it five years back that your system is going to be attacked in that particular way. Okay, so it's always something that you will have to deal with. And you know, the CEOs will come and say something like, oh, you know, we are very sorry to our customers and all that stuff. But the fact of the matter is that's an uncertainty. And you just have to deal with it, okay? There's just no way you can get around it. And so how hackers are going to hack your system is, it could either be a risk or it could be an uncertainty. Risks can be mitigated. Uncertainties may or may not get mitigated. So let's, let's try and understand. Uh, you have a car, uh, let's assume that you have a car and your car is a smart car. So it's connected to the internet, you know, somebody can remotely lock your car, somebody can remotely unlock your car and all that stuff. Now, you are uncertain about when your car will be hacked, okay? What's the decision you're going to make when you go and buy a car? So you, you went into the dealership, you have a very nice smart car with like lots of features, you know, internet connectivity, blah, blah, blah. And you have a very dumb car, which has absolutely zero connectivity. You have to basically put the key in and then you have to unlock the door and you have to get inside the car and it's like a manual car, so you have to switch gears and all that stuff. And you know about the fact that at some point of time, uh, there will be hacking on the vehicle, okay? There will be because it's an easy thing to hack and it can create a very large scale disaster. And there are many people who would want to create large scale disaster. So therefore, you know, you want to be safe in that particular situation. That's your goal. What are you going to do? What, what are your thoughts? So you're dealing with an uncertain situation. You don't know whether it will be hacked or not. It's not something that happens on a day-to-day -day basis. So you are totally in this uncertain domain where you cannot assess the probability. So what is your line of action going to be? Making the system more robust. What do you mean by making the system more robust? I mean, you can only make the system robust where you understand the risk. So, so you know that your tire can deflate at some point of time, right? So you can create a robust vehicle driving control system so that if, if the tire gets uh, uh, punctured while you are driving on the road, you can still safely stop on the side of the road. That's a risk that people know. People have seen this like a million times in the past and they have understood how to control that risk and make things robust. Uh, I'm talking about hacking, okay? So, yeah, please, go ahead. So, I will see if there are any attacks on the system, but not my system, but any other system which is similar to mine. Okay. So, I'll be able to get a beta distribution. I'll do an update of the beta distribution and see what is the probability of my system getting attacked. That's a, there are a lot of assumptions there. You know, so, uh, so the, the answer is, I'm going to look at other systems that are similar to my system, and then I'm going to estimate the probability. As a consumer, so you are a consumer, you go into a car showroom and somebody tells you this is a smart car, and you just started crunching numbers in your head, thinking about all the subsystems that are similar to this vehicle, and then you are doing crunching about, oh, I think according to Bayes' rule, this is the probability that my system will get attacked in Columbus, Ohio, um, and, and therefore, I think I'm willing to take that risk. That's what you're going to do. Okay. That's a lot of number crunching, by the way. Nobody else is going to do that number crunching. Okay. So do you have a Python interpreter in your brain? <laughs> so, okay. So what else? What else can you do? Go for less features. Go for? Go for a car with less features. Go for a car with less features. So you are going to be extremely averse to uncertainty. 
Um, and that's actually a very, very human thing to do. And that's actually part of our evolutionary strategy, which is if you have an uncertain situation, you just want to avoid it completely because you don't understand the risk. So uh, if you're foraging and you know that in this particular area, there are a lot of tigers or leopards or whatever, you just don't want to go into that area because there's a lot of uncertainty whether you will get attacked or not. Right? On the other hand, there is this particular part of the village where uh, there are no predators or the predators are very, very rare. And then you will definitely go there and forage for food and stuff. So humans, by their very nature, are extremely risk averse. Most humans, okay, there are of course humans that are risk seeking and they are the ones who, you know, fly the plane uh, beyond Mach 1 and they become fighter pilots and they go to space station and all that stuff. So those are the humans that are risk seeking. They can take risks. Uh, they can even take uh, uncertain risks. For instance, the people who went to the moon for the first time or maybe the second time. So they are the ones who didn't know what the uncertainty is going to be, but they are still willing to take that leap of faith. Okay, but then there are, uh, most of the people are risk averse in their day-to-day -day activities. And so when you are faced with a situation where you have a smart car and you have a dumb car, and you know that at some point of time, some sort of hacking will happen, but you don't quite know whether that is going to blow up the car or that's just going to create some minor inconvenience in the car. So because there is uncertain, you are just not going to take that action and you're going to go with a dumb car so that you're not hacked and you can manage the uncertainty by just not having that uncertainty at all, by going for a dumb car. So this is something, again, that you need to understand. These are uh, the aspects of things that you will encounter in your job when you go outside and you will work for the cybersecurity firms. And nobody is going to tell you all this stuff, but that's something you need to keep at the back of your mind, that if your supervisor is telling you something, they may have considered it as a risk, but there are always uncertainties that can hit the system and there is no way for you to figure that out, uh, what those uncertainties are. And when it happens, you will be on the front line trying to manage the situation, but, uh, but who knows you know, how the system is going to evolve at that time. So just something to keep in mind. Now let's not talk, so I'm not going to touch upon the subject of uncertainty. We have spent enough time understanding what uncertainty means. So we'll not touch upon this particular subject and we will just talk about risks in the rest of the entire class all the way until the end of the semester. Uh, knowing well that there are uncertainties that we cannot predict beforehand. Now the way to measure risk is through probability distribution. So I don't know what the weather is going to be tomorrow, but I can with some confidence say that the peak temperature is going to be about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Maybe it'll be 76, maybe it'll be 84, but it cannot be 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Like that's just not possible. And uh, the, the, the lowest temperature is going to be 55 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe 58 or 59 degrees Fahrenheit, but the lowest temperature cannot be 100 degrees Fahrenheit tomorrow. Okay, so there is a way to measure the risk and that measurement is done through probability distribution. So what we are going to do now is we are going to talk about how to mathematically frame this notion of risk in the probabilistic way and this is not the only way by which you measure risk, but this is the most common way and that's what we are going to talk about. Um, so how do we measure risk in terms of probability distribution? And once we understand probability, then we are going to talk about uh, statistics. And the statistics means that there is a process which has a well-known probability distribution and I'm looking at samples from that particular process. And how do I measure if something has changed or something has certain properties? How do we measure that? And that's actually measured through statistics. So for instance, when did the season change from summer to winter? Okay, so you're measuring temperature. It's a random process. You're measuring temperature and you want to figure out, okay, now I think the fall has arrived or now I think the winter has arrived. So you want to, and that's, that particular decision making happens through statistics. So that's why we'll talk about probability and then we'll talk about statistics in uh, subsequent lectures. Any questions so far on risk versus uncertainty?
Okay, no question. So let's talk about probability. Set of all unknowns or variables. So for temperature, omega could be, let's say we are in the city of Columbus, 20 degrees F to 110 degrees F. Again, minus 20 degrees F is highly unlikely, 110 degrees F is highly unlikely. But I'll just throw it in the set of all unknowns or variables. Humidity, this is actually easy. Omega can be between 0 or 100 percent. So either you are completely arid, 0 degree relative humidity, or you are completely uh, saturated, which means it's 100 percent humidity. So whenever it rains, the humidity is close to 100 percent. Let's think about temperature of this building. Omega is going to be 70 degrees F to 76 degrees F raised to 50. So there are 50 rooms in this building. And my temperature ranges between, in each of the room, the temperature ranges between 70 to 76 degrees Fahrenheit. And these are all the closed intervals. I'm not uh, talking about discrete set. And let's say a coin, omega is, it's a discrete set, head or tails. Oh, let me write 10 toss of a coin. So it's head tails raised to 10. That's my omega. Okay, so is it clear what omega means? It's the set of all things you can possibly see during the entire process, okay? So omegas could be a set of all trajectories as well, like because these are the trajectories, for instance, for weather, it's not just a temperature at a certain time, but it could be temperature over an entire day. So in that case, omega is the sequence of temperature that you're going to see over the entire day. So it could be very, very, very large set, okay? Now, sometimes omega could be numeric value and it's an interval. Sometimes it's discrete value and it's not an interval, but it, it's just like a discrete set of things. If you have a die, uh, a fair die, then omega is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, because the die has like six, six faces. Um, if you have a, if you're playing chess, for instance, omega is extremely huge discrete set because there are only discrete number of moves on a chess board. And so it's a very, 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 very large, but discrete set um, in the case of chess. So, so depending on the application, your omega could be large, omega could be small and so on. You have a set A, which is a subset of omega, and this is called an event. And you have a probability P, which maps subsets of omega to a value between 0, 1, and this is known as probability distribution.
Okay. So let's consider the weather tomorrow, the temperature uh, tomorrow at 4 p.m. So that's around the time when the maximum temperature is reached. What's the probability? So let's consider A. So let's consider omega to be minus 20 and 110. Let's consider A to be, so that's the closed interval minus 20 to 110. Uh, I'm talking about the maximum temperature tomorrow. So let me take A to be 76 and 85. Now, of course, I can go to my phone and I can figure out what the temperature forecast for tomorrow is, but let's assume that temperature forecast is somewhere in this interval. The probability of A is going to be, what do you think the probability of A is going to be? So A is the event and P maps events to a number between 0 and 1, which tells you how confident you are that that event is going to happen tomorrow. So in this case, I am pretty confident that probability of A, like the temperature, the maximum temperature tomorrow is going to be between 76 and 85. I am extremely confident because of which I am going to assign this interval probability 1 because I'm extremely sure that this is what the maximum temperature is going to be based on all the data that I have seen so far. Let me write it here. This is extreme certainty. Okay. What if, so omega is the same. Let me take another value of A which is a subset of omega minus 20 to 30, what do you think probability of A is going to be? What's the probability that tomorrow's maximum temperature is going to be between minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit to 30 degrees Fahrenheit? Zero, okay? So this probability is zero. There is extreme certainty here as well. So I know for sure that the temperature cannot be in this particular range. What if I write A equals to 76 to 80 or 76 to 78? What's the probability of A? Okay, so here I was completely certain, here I was completely certain that the temperature cannot be in that range. Now here, there is some amount of uncertainty. I'm, uh, well, I shouldn't say uncertainty. There is some amount of risk. And so I'm not going to assign it the full one or zero number, but I can assign it like 0 0.2, which means that I have, there's a 20% chance that the maximum temperature tomorrow is going to be between 76 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere in, mid in the middle, 20% chance, okay? And so you can specify all these different probabilities for every possible subset of omega, uh, and you can assign it a number between zero and one. Okay, so that's probability distribution. There are of course uh, very sophisticated measure theoretic uh, approach to defining probability distribution which we won't talk about here. The only thing I'm going to mention about this distribution is as follows. Probability of empty set should be zero. Probability of omega should be one. And if A intersection B is a null set, so this is null set, empty set, then probability of A union B should be probability of A plus probability of B.
okay now the funny thing is that probability doesn't just satisfy finite additivity this is a finite additivity property so if you have finite number of disjoint sets then the probability of finite number of unions is the sum of probability of individual sets individual events uh, actually probability satisfies what is known as countable additivity so i have a sequence ai i goes from 1 to infinity and these are all disjoint sets then the probability of union of ai i equals 1 to infinity is actually summation probability of ai i equals 1 to infinity so this is countable additivity condition and the probability distribution must satisfy this condition any questions so far okay Now when we talk about probability measures there are a few things we also need to understand one is known as the concept of random variable or random vector and the other is mean and variance um so these are the quantities that characterize well that doesn't characterize but once you understand the probability distribution that's the next thing you need to understand um so if there are no questions i'm going to erase this and i'm going to talk about random variables remember that omega is an abstract set and omega can take head and tails it can take 0 1 it can take minus infinity plus infinity interval so it can take a lot of different uh, uh like it can be very abstract on and off this omega is a very abstract set so we cannot really do any mathematical operations on an abstract set right we can talk about the set theoretic stuff like unions and intersections and subsets and all that stuff but we can't really perform mathematical calculations So in order to do mathematical in order to enable us to do mathematical calculation we need to understand the notion of random variables which is a function x that maps omega to r and a random vector would map omega to rn Okay so if omega is hot or cold or, or omega is temperature i mean temperature is a real number uh so if consider the situation um you go to a casino and you are gambling and the person says okay if your cards have this this and this combination you are going to get 10 dollars otherwise you are going to get 0 dollars right so omega is the set of all sequence of cards you can get and this r is basically the 10 dollar versus 0 dollar right so your your random variable there is x which maps omega which is a sequence of cards to 10 dollars or 0 dollars right so that's a random variable um if i give you the same example head and tails if if 
if you get head, then I give you one dollar. If you get tails, then you give me one dollar. That's again a random variable. So it maps head or tails to plus one or minus one. So that's a random variable. Now that we have mapped omega to a real number or omega to a, Euclid, uh, uh, a vector, I can now perform things like integration and I can talk about mean and variance. So here is the definition of mean or expected value. So expected value E of x is integral of x of omega p of d omega. And this integral is over the entire set omega. The way to think of this integral, well, have any of you seen this notation before, p of d omega before? I, I would guess no. So the way to think about this p of d omega is, this is the probability omega plus d omega. So probability of the interval omega and omega plus d omega. d omega is just some uh, small value, some small number. So that's what p of d omega means. And so you're taking the integral or you're taking the infinite summation, okay. Integral of x omega p d omega. This is just the integral omega i, probability of omega i to omega i plus one i goes from 1 to infinity. So this is, of course, Riemann sum. This is the way to do the probability, sorry, the integral uh, using what is known as a Riemann integral. But, uh, but this is not the actual way by which this integral is typically understood. But I'm not going to get into the math. Uh, this is something that you might have seen before. And so I'm just writing it here so that you recognize that this is how this probability will get this uh, integral will get uh, computed. That's the mean or expected value. It's the average value of the random variable. But how do you do averaging? Well, you weigh it according to the probability measure of uh, that particular random variable or the underlying randomness. Okay, so this is the way to think about mean. Mean is average, what we expect on an average. This is what we expect this random variable to be. So that's random variable, uh, sorry, that's mean or expected value. Uh, a similar notion is variance, where variance of x is integral x minus expected value of x square pd omega. This is integral over all omega. Let me, yeah, okay, this is fine. I should probably write it as x of omega. x of omega minus expected value of x square p of t omega. That's variance.
ओके पर हैप्स मीन इज एन इजी थिंग टू अंडरस्टैंड ओके सो मीन इज वॉट वी एक्सपेक्ट दैट नंबर टू बी अराउंड दैट सो यू एक्सपेक्ट दैट थिंग्स विल बी अराउंड दैट नंबर मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम at least that's what the term expected value uh, if you think about it that's what it means what do you think variance means so what happens if a random variable has a small variance what happens when this integral is small x of omega will be close to the mean so if variance of x is small x of omega is close to the expected value of x so there isn't much variation in the value of x the random variable x that's what variance measures what happens when variance of x is large what happens when a variance of x is large what would that signify what happens when this integral has very large num it has a large number like it's it's equal to 1 million what do you think is happening what values of x of omega would be so what are the values of x of omega so that this particular variance number is extremely huge a million a billion or something like that so that happens when x of omega is actually far from the mean a lot of weight is put on x of omega that is far away from the mean so most x of omega is far from mean expected value of x okay so things are very far apart let me give you an example If you are a graduate research assistant the paycheck you get month to month is there a variance associated with that paycheck do you think that your month to month paycheck changes i don't know how many of you are graduate research assistants here but if you are an assistant in the university at least between september of 2021 and all the way until august of 2022 your paycheck is going to be the same as long as you are working for the university so it's it's constant every end of the month you will get whatever 2120 dollars 50 cents in your bank account and so in that case the variance of x is zero it's not a random variable anymore on the other hand if you are a real estate agent or you are a consultant or you are a web designer who works for uh, some online uh, uh, gig website or if you are an uber or a lift driver in that case today you could earn a lot of money because there are a lot of drunk people who want to go back home and tomorrow everybody is sober nobody wants to take a cab and your your total income is going to be very small right so in that case your variance of x is reasonable amount of reasonable number it's a very very reasonable number on the other hand if you are a company like microsoft or adobe or or samsung you are investing in a lot of research and development right so you are putting in a lot of money but the outcome of that r&d project is going to be extremely large sometimes you can make a lot of money like you invest 100000 dollars or maybe like a million dollars in developing a product and you get a billion dollars out of it sometimes you you put in like 5 million dollars of effort and you don't actually get a product out of it so in r&d 
the variance of X, the variance of payoff is extremely large. And so either only big companies like Microsoft and Google and Amazon and Samsung, those are the ones who can invest in uh, research and development because the variance of the profit is very large, or the government invests money in research and development because again, the variance of, of, of X is extremely large in, uh, in, in R&D type problems, in R&D types activities. Okay, so you can understand that there are situations where variance is naturally very small, weather forecast variance is very small, or in some cases where variance is extremely large, depending on the situation. Does that make sense? Okay. So we talked about mean and variance. Um, in the next class, I'm, I'm going to wrap up today because this is all I have. Um, in the next class, we are going to talk about different types of probability distribution. So we'll talk about probability distributions when omega is a subset of real line. And we'll talk about probability distribution where omega is a discrete set. Okay? And uh, we understand the probability distributions, then we'll talk about uh, uh, statistics. What statistics does is now you have set up this probability, this random variables. Now you are observing different realizations. Okay, so let me tell you the concept of realization. So realization of random variables, so x1, x2, x3, and so on. So this is the maximum temperature for today, maximum temperature for tomorrow, maximum temperature for day after tomorrow, and so on. So those are realizations of random variables. There is a random variable, there is a random process, and there is a realization of that random process that you observe on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we are going to talk about, there is an unknown process, and I'm looking at the realization of that unknown process how do I understand what the mean and the variance of that underlying random variable is? And how do we understand the distribution of this random variable just by looking at this random process? So that's something we will talk about when we, when we touch upon the subject of statistics on Friday. And then we'll talk about hypothesis testing and whatnot in the next week. So thank you for your attention. I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>